Welcome to the 2014-15 Bannon Institute on Ignatian Leadership. I, am, I have been specifically asked to ask you to silence all of your cell phones at this moment. My name is Mick McCarthy and I serve as the Executive Director of the Ignatian Center for Jesuit Education here at Santa Clara. Uh, in this last year's Bannon Institute, we have been exploring the theme of leadership, taking our inspiration from the spirituality of St. Ignatius of Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits. And this quarter, the winter quarter, we are focusing on the role of faith within the practice of Ignatian leadership engaging the foundational witness of Jesus, the leadership of Pope Francis, and the catalyzing examples of men and women with Ignatian vocations. Today's event is co-sponsored by the Diocese of San Jose, and we are delighted to be joined by so many people from the diocese, uh, including Bishop McGraw, Bishop Daly, Sister Rosalie Pizzo, and men and women from a range of religious communities working in the diocese. This year, we have been celebrating uh, the year of consecrated life. And the theme of the year is quite beautifully articulated uh, in, in a single phrase. We are celebrating the joy of a faithful yes. Not long ago in Commonweal Magazine, the joy of a faithful yes was compellingly described in an article by Sister Helen Maher Garvey. As a first grader in the year 1941, she was asked by her teacher why she, what she wanted to be when she grew up. Well, she didn't say it out loud. The thought immediately came to her mind, I want to be a sister like you, Sister Mary. Relatively few years later, she entered the novitiate of the Sisters of Charity of the Blessed Virgin Mary of Dubuque, Iowa, and there began a long journey of religious life through very changing times, many highs and lows with significant participation in the Leadership Conference of Religious Women. As Helen Ma Maher Garvey comes to the end of the article, however, she looks back on her first grade self and reflects on what she once said so spontaneously. I want to be a sister just like you. But as an older woman with much more experience of religious life, she adds this you is no longer the idolized young sister, but rather the person of Jesus Christ, whose spirit moving in our church calls me and every woman religious to heed a basic summons articulated at Vatican II, the joys and hopes, the griefs and anxieties of men and women of this age, especially the poor or anyone afflicted. These are the joys and hopes the griefs and anxieties of the followers of Christ. Indeed, this is the joyful yes that members of religious communities are called to in a very unique way. But let me also take the moment to highlight and offer a special thanks to our sisters, the religious women of this diocese, for the joy of your faithful yes. These last years have been difficult for religious women in the church. And as a fellow religious whose own vocation was nurtured literally by the examples of generous, loving women who taught and cared for me and my family, I continue to learn from your own perseverance and love. I'm sure I am not alone. I'm certainly not alone among my own religious community in, in desiring simply and with great affection to thank you for your witness your grace, your dedication to those in need, your courageous fidelity to Jesus and to the church, in short, for the joy of your faithful yes. Quite appropriately then, in this context, I'm pleased to introduce a woman who I'm sure could very well introduce herself. She is a member of the Sister of Social Services, an attorney poet with extensive experience in public policy and advocacy for systemic change. In Washington, D.C., as executive director of Network since 2004, she lobbies on issues of peace building, immigration reform, health care, and economic justice. Around the country, she is a noted speaker and educator on these public policy issues. We're grateful that she actually escaped the storms of the East Coast 
to be, just to be able to be with us today to speak on a view from the bus reflecting on the axles of faith and justice, please welcome Sister Simone Campbell. Thank you um, for the introduction, but mostly for setting this in a context. Because I think the view from the bus has been pretty surprising. Who would think it? And I say um, my approach was join the convent, lead a quiet life. <laughs> and who would know? Who would expect the mischief of the Holy Spirit that stirs up so much opportunity? But the piece that is so compelling for me about being a woman religious is that it is all about our mission. It is all about the charism of our communities and where we are called to carry the gospel to places it would not be otherwise. I was just talking to a couple of the Holy Name sisters and heard that they're living in another setting, not up in their place in Los Gatos, and they're able to be ministers in this new setting in their retirement. Because the gift of our lives is that it's always about the other. Now, this has turned out to be a bit annoying to some in the institution, you might have noticed. <laughs> but the, the faithfulness is the given, is that by definition, our role as women religious is to live on the edge carrying the gospel. And the role of our leadership, our bishops, is to care for the institution and to build it up and to have other concerns. And we need both. But quite often, historically, we've been able to annoy each other in some very creative ways. <laughs> and that creativity is the movement of the spirit. And so as you look at leadership, for me, the key is are we being faithful to mission, to our call, to respond as it's given to us to respond? Am I faithful to the wee small voice of the Spirit in our lives at network to bring the gospel wherever I'm called? Occasionally to colleges and universities like being here at Santa Clara, or last week it was up on Capitol Hill meeting with legislators in a very challenging congressional setting. Um, but being faithful to that gospel is key. And Pope Francis, who's this fabulous advertisement for the joy of being a member of a religious community and what it does to one's spiritual life, says in Joy of the Gospel that an authentic faith always implies a deep desire to save the world. And it's that deep desire that I think has been nourished in us in this quest for justice. And what we found is the amazing thing about the bus is that it was truly a gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, some of you have heard this story, and I, I'm always nervous. I'll bore my audience. So let me just tell the story briefly. But, you know, the, how it all got started actually was at our 40th anniversary party at Network. And a bunch of you are, told me you're Network members, you know Network. Um, and we were founded in December of 1971. We opened our doors in April of 72. So in April of 2012, we had this great party to celebrate 40 years on Capitol Hill. It was April 14th, I remember it vividly. And the big question at our celebration was, 
how do we let people know we've been working on Capitol Hill for 40 years to make Catholic social teaching part of our federal policy? How do we get the word out? You have to be very careful what you pray for because we had very little ideas. We thought maybe we could get a ad in, you know, a, a, a Google ad or a Facebook ad to kind of invite people in, or we could invite a member to get a member. Well, four days later, four days, the Vatican answered our prayer by naming our little organization as being a bad influence on Catholic sisters in the United States. <laughs> they actually said network was undermining Catholic sisters in the United States. Now you have to know at the time we only had nine full-time staff <laughs> and we were focused on federal policy. Hmm. But very quickly I knew that Network could be public because we have no direct connection to Rome. The Leadership Conference of Women Religious, which was the focus of the censure, was created by Rome. So they had to be very uh, engaged in that deeper story with the Vatican. But I was free. So um, the Holy Spirit led me to talking to a whole lot of reporters. But my question very quickly became in prayer. Actually, if you want to know what my prayer was at the time, it was sort of like, help, help, help. Because what felt like um, this moment of interest in women religious, my help plea was, how do we stay faithful to mission in the face of this opportunity? And what came to me was, remember the story of the women at the well? And Jesus is in Samaria, not in Israel. He's in a foreign land. He is a Jewish man who's not supposed to talk to a Samaritan. He's a man he's not supposed to talk to a woman. And what does he do? Is he's in this foreign land. He talks to the woman and he asks her for help. And where that led me in my prayer was to be willing to ask the secular community for help. And so we did this, we had a meeting at Network, we had about 35 people representing 35 different organizations, and the sign of the Holy Spirit was at the end of an hour and a half meeting, we knew we were going on a bus, we were pushing back against the Paul Ryan budget and lifting up the works of Catholic sisters. But the sign of how it's Pentecost is that no one knows who first said road trip. No one knows who first said let's go on the road. And everybody was clear we had to go in a wrapped bus. Now, I, was, I knew nothing about buses. I was terrified that a wrapped bus had something to do with rap music, <laughs> but, which I don't like. But what turned out, it was that amazing wallpaper on our bus that some of you got a chance to see that set, it became like a, a, a moving billboard around the country. And so now we've done three of these trips. I often go places and people are really glad to see me. They're very, oh, we admire your work, it's really nice, but Sister Simone, where's your bus? <laughs> it's like the bus has become a person. And that's what I want to talk about, is because what I think the bus does is the bus creates a place where all are welcome in community. And in our individualized, polarized nation, what is often missing is that community. We know here, I mean, here in Silicon Valley, my glory, you all have, are sort of like ground zero for uh, pressure and competition and innovation and making things different and fast and what a pressure. And while we do, um, Facebook and Twitter and various Googling. We have all these new verbs in our vocabulary. Where can my heart rest? Where do I know somebody has my back? How are we in this together? 
And for me, leadership that comes from faith is following Jesus. And when you look at what Jesus did, Jesus walked towards trouble at every step. He walked towards the lepers of the day. He walked towards the blind. He walked towards the Pharisees and Sadducees. He walked towards everyone and tried to create a community that could include the 100%. It was Jesus' challenge to his age to say all are welcome. And remember that great story about the guy that wanted to be healed and it was so crowded around Jesus that what they do? They took him up on the roof and took off the roof tiles. Sort of like Spanish architecture, I'm sure, where he could actually move the tiles and dropped him into the middle because he wanted to be in touch with Jesus. I have a hunch that our nation is so hungry for that sense of belonging that sense of being seen, that sense of being a part of something bigger. Because in creation, we are not meant to be individualistic. St. Paul has this wonderful thing about how we are one body. We are one body. We're all connected, but often we're not aware of it. So what I'd like to do is share a few stories that fit with how this body leads to justice. The view from the bus is meeting a bunch and bunch of people with amazing stories. But what Jesus did was to walk towards people who were in trouble and let his heart be broken open. And if we have a broken heart, then what I've discovered is there's room for everyone. When my heart's kind of closed up and I'm like, well, I'm not letting you in, then I'm closed. I, I don't have room for everyone. But once I hear your story, it makes a difference. Leadership, I believe, is about letting your heart be broken open and then responding to what you hear. So let me tell you a few stories of, of folks that I've met that have broken my heart. and. This really is about letting our sense of the whole find that way to justice. Now, I met uh, Robin about uh, nine months ago now when President Obama signed the um, executive order to raise the minimum wage for the um, federal contract workers. And Robin was, it's about, 25, I think 26, and uh, she'd grown up in Virginia, right across the river from DC, but she could not believe she was in the White House. Now here's how my life is. You know, oh yes, when I was in the White House, it was fine, you know. But what we, what Robin was like ecstatic that she had always walked by the White House, and we were in the second row, and the president was going to be right in front of us. And Robin has her cell phone out, she's taking a picture of the chair she's sitting in, and then she has me take a picture of her sitting in her chair, and we got talking. And she said she was there to celebrate that one of her friends was going to get a raise because of this executive order, and she was really excited. Because if her friend got a raise, eventually she might get a raise. Robin works full-time in a national clothing store chain in the Virginia area, or D.C. area. She works full-time, makes what's the national minimum wage. California's done better than the national, but it's $7.25 an hour. And she'd worked there for over a year and a half at $7.25. She'd just gotten a raise to $7.30. But she said to me after I admired the dress she was wearing, it was really beautiful. She'd gotten it with her employee discount. She was so excited. It was sapphire blue. It looked stunning on her. And she said, you know, no one would ever know by looking at me that I have to live in a homeless shelter because I can't afford rent in this area on my salary. Now my hunch is that could quite likely be true in this area also. Even though you have a higher minimum wage, you have a really high cost of living. 
And what I learned from Robin was Robin's working hard. Robin is working hard to make a go of it and was delighted to be contributing and celebrating the fact that her friend was going to get a raise. But my heart was broken by Robin's story because who are we as a nation that someone would work full time but can't afford rent? That's wrong in the richest nation on earth. There is enough to go around if we share. But what that requires is a sense of community that then says, I suffer if you suffer. On the bus this year, we did a big bus trip that kept getting longer and longer. I thought it was sort of the bus trip that would never end in advance of the election, trying to get folks in low-income communities to turn out to vote. And what we discovered was folks in low-income communities are working so hard, there's hardly any time to pay attention to voting. It was really discouraging. Um, I, I met, I, we were door knocking in Colorado Springs and this guy, tall guy, answers the door in middle of the day and I find out, he's probably like early 30s, he's a disabled vet. And I asked him if he was gonna vote. And he said, nah, I'm not gonna vote. I go, why not? I'm just trying to get by. People don't want my opinions. They don't want to know what I think. Here's a guy who is willing to put his life on the line for our nation, but thinks people don't want his ideas. Who are we as a nation that we don't invite each other in? We were in Clayton County, Georgia. Clayton County, George, I, I, I have to do my Georgia accent. It's just, I tried really hard. I pick up accents very easily, even though I'm not very good at them. But what we learned in Clayton County, Georgia, which is just, uh, you know where the Atlanta airport is? Okay, it's on the, let me think, it's on the northern end of Clayton County. Clayton County became the place where in the 19, uh, when were the uh, Olympics in Atlanta? In uh, 92, 96. They moved most of the African American population out of central Atlanta to use it to make the venues for the Olympics. And they moved them to Clayton County. And they said, we'll have this fabulous transit program for you about down there. You can get wherever you want. It'll be fabulous, fantastic, better housing. So everybody moved to Clayton County. In, it was 96. In 99, they defunded the transit, pro, the transit system. And from 1999 until 2014, they had no transit system. And people banded together, they got the state legislature to pass money for it, but Clayton County did not want the money. Clayton County was independent. Clayton County was run by folks who didn't need public transit. But all of the African American community that had been moved to Clayton County had no way to get to work. Kids had no way to get to schools in Atlanta. People were staying overnight at work at the airport because they couldn't get home. And so they'd come home on weekends. We were there in campaign to finally get Clayton County a transit system and it passed. They had to get 66% of the vote. And they got it because people finally understood that it affected all of them. Two young kids were killed on the side of a highway because they were walking to school three miles. It was horrifying. But what I realized in Clayton County is things are complicated because we don't understand each other's lives. And so from the bus what I've learned is that faith leads us into touching people's lives, just as Jesus did. But touching people's lives then, it has consequences. I am no longer the same because I knew Clayton County folks were suffering. I'm not the same because I know Robin lives in a homeless shelter. 
I'm also, let me, I need a prop. Hold on a sec. I'm also not the same because on the first bus trip, some of you have heard me talk about this, but on the first bus trip in Cincinnati, um, Jeannie and her partner, um, Lynn, brought me this picture of Margaret, Jeannie's sister, who died because when Margaret lost her job, she lost her health care. Margaret died in 2012 at the age of 56 because in the richest nation on earth, she didn't have health care. Now, Obamacare got passed in 2010, but it was not fully implemented until 13. And what, or excuse me, yeah, 13. So what we realized was that Medicaid is the way, or Medi-Cal in California, is the way for folks who lose their job to get, Medi-Cal or Medicaid is the way to get health care. Now the Supreme Court, in its beloved wisdom, said, oh, states don't have to provide Medicaid. So the big fight is there's still 23 states where Margaret would die without health care. Now, at this Catholic university, for me, the fact that Margaret died in the richest nation on earth because she didn't have access to health care, that is a pro-life issue. That is an issue we need to stand up for. And that is what, on the bus, has fueled my passion to ensure that in all states in our nation, Medicaid is available to folks who otherwise would not have access to health care. Now, do you know what happened, though? So Margaret has fueled my passion. It's wonderful. I, keep, I carry all these folks in my Bible. Uh, they are a source of constant inspiration. But on the bus, this year, we were in Lexington, Kentucky, and this woman comes up to me, taps me on the shoulder just before we're going to go on in this big rally, and we're there with Allison Lundergan Grimes and a whole bunch of other people and big politicos, and the ba there's a band. I mean, sometimes these things get out of hand. But this woman comes up and taps me on the shoulder and says, I'm Nancy. I'm Margaret Kistler's sister, one of Margaret Kistler's sister, and I just want to thank you for helping to heal our family. And she walks away, and I go, what? So I jumped up, chased her, hugged her, and I hugged everybody, cried. What happened was their family was really divided because they felt so guilty that Margaret had died, and they didn't know how bad she was and that she didn't have health care. She apparently was pretty stubborn. But what had happened for them was that my talking about Margaret and Margaret's fueling my commitment to make social change provided some healing to them because they could see some meaning in an otherwise meaningless death. Now here's the thing. If we are like Jesus and walk towards trouble and let our hearts be broken by these sins of our time, and we try to do something about it, we have no idea where the consequence takes us. We only need to do our part, but what I discovered with my speaking of Margaret is part of that result was healing for the family. Now just imagine if we each took one action how many additional ripples would be out there? Now, for me, what this means then is that faith leads me towards the pain of the world as real, and it frees in me the sense of what is justice for the 100%. But faith also lets me know we can't do it all. The curse of many of us who consider ourselves more on the progressive edge, more of the activists, the old timers, we have a tendency to think that we have to do it all. 
And I've had so many people tell me, oh, oh my heavens, they, they, they just can't do, uh, you know, it's just too much. Faith does not call us to do it all. Because what that does then is to say, I'm God, I'm in charge, and I'll take care of it. Thank you very much. Now, there are days where I think we probably each sign up to be God. Have you ever found, have you ever found your prayer where you just say, now, God, you need to fix it this way? But what we know is no. Rather, our prayer needs to be, lead me. The prayer that I think Jesus had in the quiet was an openness to the moment, to being led. And if we listen quietly to that wee small voice, then we get led to, be, to do our part, our place, our contribution to the whole body of God. Now, listening is something that's a little challenging in our world. Have you noticed that? Um, but I think perhaps that is the biggest spiritual practice that we could be called to, to that letting go, to knowing I'm not God, I'm not in charge, and to listen to where we're being led. <laughs> you got to be careful, though, because it leads to places like buses, which are surprising. Now, listening then means being willing to let go of my agenda, my plan, my insights. It doesn't mean we quit having plans, it just means that we hold them lightly. Who of us who entered religious life would ever have imagined where we would be in 2015 on the day we entered? Lord knows I didn't. But look at the giftedness of it. How we can be alive in the midst, how we can be mustard seed, mustard seed for a hungry nation, how we can be deep listeners to the call of the Spirit to give something new. Now, I know there's a bunch of students here who have been in the Ignatian spirituality class and trying to puzzle out what is this? It is the deep integration of hunger and hope. Hunger for something more for our world and hope, which is the promise of Christ. It is hunger and hope that comes together to create this opportunity that Pope Francis says is our desire to change the world. Hunger and hope leads us into innovative, creative spots. It leads us to try something new. It leads us in the dark to trust. To trust that we will be led not left orphaned, and always, always be held in the palm of God's hand. I think in our very rich nation, this perhaps is our biggest challenge, that we accept we're only creatures, that we hold on to something beyond ourselves and know the treasure is that we will be led. There's a saying I read recently, let's see if I can do it, where in the dark, put your hand in the hand of God and that is light enough and you will walk in the unknown way, which is security. 
That, I think, is my experience of religious life. It's my experience of the intersection of faith and justice, and it is the challenge that we share. So let your hearts be broken by the stories around us. Let us be nourished by each other, and let us fight for a vision that makes a difference. And in that, oops, I did one more piece. I wanted to close this part, and then we're going to open it up to conversation. But I wanted to close with a, a poem of mine from my handy dandy book, which happens to be in the back. Um, is it's a poem I wrote in 2002, December of 2002, before we invaded Iraq. I had a chance to go on a small peace delegation, and it probably was one of the most powerful experiences of my life. But coming back, uh, we drove from Baghdad to Amman, Jordan, and we got caught in a sandstorm. And that sandstorm was terrifying because it goes brown and beige, and it's like super dense fog only it makes you sneeze because it's dust that gets into the car. And um, you have to keep moving on the highway even though you can't see anything because other people keep moving on the highway and they said people died because they stopped. <laughs> and then our driver, could you believe this, our driver handed this roll of scotch tape to Rick who was sitting in the front passenger seat and said, Keep an eye on the front windshield, and if you see a crack forming, put a piece of scotch tape on it. Now, I have no idea if that would have worked, but what our driver said is he had experienced the sand being blown so hard that the front windshield imploded into the car. Now, I don't know if scotch tape would have worked, but I'll tell you, what happened was all of us had our eyes riveted on the front windshield. And after, I don't know how long it was, I, I kept thinking it was almost over because it would get light and then it would get dark again. And then light and dark and light and dark. And finally we got to like a 10 inch wide band of rain and all of a sudden we were out into desert clear. It was crystal clear. And we could look back and see the sandstorm. <laughs> One, we were so glad to be out of it. But the other thing that we found out was that wild camels in the desert run towards the trailing edge of sandstorms because they know there's water there. So the very thing that created destruction also created life. And this is the poem that was given because I think it, poems just get given. So, and I tried to pay attention occasionally. And it's called Compassion's Path. Because from the bus we know that it's the intersection of faith and justice is evidenced in a heart of compassion. And um, it goes like this. We walk a sandstorm of impotence, isolated dread, the demons of our day. We walk a sandstorm of half-truths, lies of ochre, beige, tan, sepia confusion, pelted, buffeted by winds of war. We walk a sandstorm of drifting elusive truth, wandering ways, and blind following. We walk a sandstorm eroded by demanding doubt, overwhelmed by the horror swirling round, invading lungs and lives. We walk a sandstorm of promised grief, aching temptation to hunker down and hide until a more propitious time. But in this time of alluring weakness, in this time of fearful groaning, cold, blind logic, anger rising, remember the clear-eyed anchor of our resolve. Remember the eyes of Mayada, Sarah, Rita, Asan, Abdullah, Makbullah, and many more. We may be blinded in the outward journey, but remember this inner core. 
May the eyes of family, terrors of family, set fire to our impotence, stoke our resolve, melt the cold stone of our hearts to yield to tears. For like rain, tears shed, settle sandstorms. Like rain, tears shed, clear the air. Like rain, tears shed, reveal the path. So let us weep. Let us embody healing tears. Let us be copious tears to settle our country's storms. Thank you very much. Now, for my favorite part. This is my favorite part. Because I love to hear your perspectives, your questions, your opportunities, your fairly short statements. Um, <laughs> often it's a temptation to think that you've got a platform and you can add yours. I really want to ask so we can get as many questions and comments out if you could focus your comments. We've got uh, three microphones that are going to be running around, so we're going to ask people to raise your hand. I also should mention, since we're live streaming this, and I heard from some friends, hi Carol Ann and a few others, that uh, they were going to watch the live streaming. So that's why we need you to have the microphone, so that they can hear the questions, okay? Is that fair or not? So I'm curious. Now, I, I, while you're thinking of your question, I should say for that clump in the back back there that I was at St. Scholastica uh, College up in Duluth, and they have a practice where students ask the first questions. Hmm. And that outsiders, or the broader community, as they like to say it in good Benedictine tradition, wait till all the student questions have been asked or comments made. So encouraging the pod in the back to, uh, to put your heads together and figure out something. Do your teachers proud, OK? Um, but let's open it up for conversation. We have about, oh, 20 minutes, 25, whoops, 25 minutes or so to do this. So we get, we've got some good time. So what, do you, what are you curious about? What do you think? What was your response? Am I nuts? Probably yes, but that's right. Oh, please. I did this with a contemplative community. They were all introverts. Everybody's head went down. <laughs> There's got to be an extrovert in the crowd someplace. Oh, thank you. All right. Microphone coming. I think one thing I take from this is the, um, the thing you said almost back to back. Where does my heart rest? And Jesus walked toward trouble. You know, it, it, it's that, like the tide, in and out, the breathing, in and out. Where does my heart rest? And Jesus walked toward trouble. I take that with me. Thank good, you. Good, good, thank you. The breathing in and out is really important because sometimes we get so, I can get so activist. A lobby on Capitol Hill, for heaven's sakes. And the, I, I've had conversations with Paul Ryan and trying to hold a heart for him. At, no, no, seriously. Holding a heart for him is key to this. To hold a heart for the 100%. But it requires the breathing. So that my care for him is as strong as my care for Robin or the folks in Clayton County. In many ways, it's easier to care for Robin and the folks in Clayton County or the Margarets. But Paul Ryan needs compassion too. In fact, I think he'd be a lot better off if he could let a little compassion in. He gets really nervous when I change our lobby visits to pastoral visits. He just changes the subject. <laughs> I sort of enjoy it, so. Good point, good point. Okay, we got a couple up here. And then this side, we'll get to, we'll, we'll do this. The question is then, how do you, how do you, I don't know, how do you can provide the opportunities to have our leaders be led to brokenness, especially in our political system? Oh, which is broken. 
Um, that's a good question. See, what I've been doing is trying to say, come meet my people. And, and so to Congressman Ryan's uh, credit, he, he tried going to a low-income community. And the report is he sat by himself in a black church, didn't talk to anybody, and they were singing and clapping, and he sat in the pew. And then he left. I think he was scared. How do we help people buffer that experience? And so I keep saying, come meet my people. Um, but I haven't had anybody take, the, take me up on it. The other part is, is that there's a whole bunch of really good legislators on both sides of the aisle, but we need to create some common experiences. And, and you all have some great folks in this area that, um, I mean, Zoe Lofgren, she graduated from your law school, um, Anna Eshoo, uh, Jackie Spear. I mean, these are really fabulous folk, but you can also reach over the hill to, I'm just blocking on his name, I can see him, in Merced. There's some Republicans that run up and down the hills. You all could do missionary work. <laughs> no, seriously, invite them here. Let them meet the people of San Jose. Let them meet folks in East Palo Alto, which I understand is changing. But folks need to have a buffer to step into the world. You need a doorway. And sometimes I think my stories become doorways for folks who have different experiences. But, um, but it's critical. Oh, I, maybe can I tell you? Oh, I can, I can tell you a couple of things, just a sec. Um, first of all, there, what we're trying to do, there's, this is the ad section, uh, Taxpayer Pride Day, April 15th. We want everybody to do a selfie, the Silicon Valley, y'all will do selfies, I'm sure, with your favorite government service and send it to us at Network. We've got some handouts in the back because we're trying to change how people see taxes. Is that I'm proud to, it's how a democracy invests in its people. And so what we need to do is to lift it up. And then um, I've got some information here about network. But the th thing that I, that I wanted to say was that this Lent, we're doing a Lenten project where we're gonna look at each of the quintiles of income, the bottom 20%, the next 20%. Each week we're gonna take a different quintile and to look at the struggle and the contribution to the common good. So that we look in Lent at the whole 100% that we're all called, we're all called to receive and contribute in the common good. And, and that effort is uh, trying to break some hearts open that it'll be accessible to folks. Let us pray to the Lord. Yeah, in the back. Um, I just have one a comment and question. Um, my comment, so I'm a JV Jesuit volunteer this year. Woo -hoo, Woo -hoo, go Jesuits. Bravo, bravo. Um, and I just wanted to express an appreciation for you saying uh, that we don't have to do it all. I think that was something 60-some JVs were grappling with this weekend and um, things that we see, students that we meet with, clients that we meet with, often it's very overwhelming uh, being in the midst of uh, institutional injustice, so to hear that was um, very affirmational once again, so thank you. Uh, my question, this is more of a, a personal curiosity, but uh, what is your image of God or your current image of God that you're drawn to? Ooh, what a lovely question. What's my current? Well, I think of God as the, what I call is the hum of the universe. God hums us into existence at every moment. And I think the reason why we sometimes think God's missing is that God's too close. That the act of creation is a continuous hum that holds us together 
And one of my, my favorite uh, folks, Pierre Desjardins, had the hymn of the universe. He actually had a whole musical symphony idea. I just have a little hum. And so I'm clearly not as uh, spiritual. Uh, but, but that sense that this loving divine imagines, hums all of us in our variety. And that this amazing God never makes a mistake in who God hums. And so when I want to vote somebody off the island, when they just annoy me, no end. Bless me, sisters and brothers, for I have sinned. And Mitch McConnell's currently on the top of that list. <laughs> and, but what I realized is, is that God hums Mitch McConnell, too, and loves Mitch McConnell. And that's the Jesus message is God is in all of us. God is all of us. So for me, the comfort of that is to know we're never alone, even if I'm frightened. Um, I had this experience um, two weeks ago, a week and a half ago on the yellow metro line where I thought we were going to die, quite frankly. One woman did die, but I thought we were going to die in this, in this smoke thing. And the breathing became important because we were just inundated with smoke. Have something of a natural fiber that you can breathe through in case you're ever in a smoke event. Because that's what I did, and it actually helped. But um, what I realized in the breathing was that God was there in that too. God was around all of us at all the time. That's what we do with it, with our knowledge of God. What a lovely idea. Thank you. Thank you for your wonderful talk. Oh, you're welcome. Um, I'm Thank a senior you. this year, and I'm, I'm a religious studies major, very Good. passionate Good. about interfaith issues. But as a student, I feel like what we do is so theoretical. We're in our heads all the time. We've got papers and exams, and, and you seem like someone who's transitioned into action. So what are your words on moving from being stuck in one's mind to really living out the change that you study so much and you study all the problems and the systems of why the change isn't taking place, but actually doing it? Listen, let your heart be broken, and listen for the next step, act. One of the challenges is especially in our nation, we like to plan out our career path and have it on. Who would ever plan out a career path to end up on a bus? I have no idea. <laughs> but the fact is, if I look back, it looks like a straight line. But groping in the dark going forward, we have no idea. Now, I didn't pay you to say that either. But if you have an interest in politics, I could advise uh, applying for our associate program, which is 11 months in DC, uh, a slightly paid uh, program. And we've got brochures back there. And we help you find low cost housing and a variety of other things. Come work with us. It's a fabulous thing. But, but I really think to trust that God hums us at every moment. We are not left orphan. Let your heart be broken. Don't manage it so much because really we think we shouldn't have broken hearts. We were supposed to be protected from it and usually it's our love life that fell apart. That's where we think of broken hearts. But let people break your hearts and then you'll know where to go. You'll know how to follow. And it might be to network. Come join us. It'll be fun. Yeah, in the back. In your speech, you said uh, in creation, we are not meant to be individualistic. So how do you suggest we cultivate a spirit of community with this generation? A spirit of community. Challenge, challenge. Uh, I have to confess, where's Terry? Yeah, Terry's here. Terry gave me a, a tour of Facebook. That's one way. Um, but I think the community that we need is to be able to know my need for another. And often we think it's about having to be the give or, giver, but to know my need. I need Robin in my life. 
to know her story. I need Margaret in my life. I need the folks in Clayton County in my life. And to know my need is then to open me to having those needs met. So here at a Catholic university, it's really important that we know our gifts, but we also know our limitations. We know what we need. And there is the match. I, I do this prayer thing sometime where I invite people to imagine all their gifts in one hand and imagine the needs in the other. Okay, got it? Imagine it. And then you reach out with one hand, and what happens is the get my if we do the same hands, my right hand has my gifts, I reach to the left hand of needs, I can meet your needs with my gifts, and I reach my needs to your gifts, then we all get connected. But I have to be willing to accept my need. And my need in our society, it's wrong to talk about our needs or to take action on them. I'm supposed to be self-sufficient, supposed to be in charge. I've got a college education. I'm tough. I'm a Catholic sister or whatever. But if we're creatures of God and heirs of heaven, heaven is created in the relationship with each other. Otherwise, we're not going to know heaven when we get there. <laughs> we're going to say, oh, what happened? That's wrong. So we have to create it here with each other. It's kind of fun. Good question. Wow, you all are geniuses. That's great. Yeah. What is your position on women's current role in the church, and where would you like to see it go? Ha <laughs> ha. My current position on women's role in the church is, um, <sighs> wake up, boys. Just wake up. Um, the, the challenge is, you know, we took 350 years to figure out Galileo might be right. We're not exactly noted for rapid change. But here's the other factor, is that most parishes I know most dioceses I know are in fact run with women. It's just nobody, ha a few have official power. And this is a place where there's a tension between um, the formal power, and I'm totally for women exercising formal power. I mean, I did have a rabid feminist phase. That was why when the Vatican said we promoted radical feminist themes incompatible with the gospel, it made me laugh, because when I was in law school, I was a rabid feminist, but that was 30 years ago. I grew up, but it's all right. Um, but, so I, I'm totally for women exercising formal authority and formal power, and progress is being made. The harder part is the change of heart that says we all create church together and it's not just about leadership. It's who are we together that makes church. Leadership is critical, critical for where we go, but it's way more. And for me, I say I work in the federal government where I have a hope of more rapid change than I do. I don't work in the institution. That's why this whole thing has been so funny is that I work on the I lobby on Capitol Hill. But kind of effectively, I guess, it made some people upset. But the gift of being upset is to not get in the fight. Sometimes when we fight, we think we, we have to fight against. And if you fight against, you push back against the domination, you reinforce the domination. So my theory, here, it's one of the controversial things I say in my book, that nobody, nobody's gotten upset about my book. I think they haven't read it, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> but one of the controversial things, I think, is that there are women's leadership and different ways of being spiritual leaders. And we need to encourage all forms of spiritual leadership. And women have that. And in our religious community, this is one of the joys of my religious community, and I'm sure for you too, is we have women presided prayers all the time. So women are spiritual leaders. I think sometimes that's why some of the 
uh, bishops get upset with us, not current company accepted. Um, some of the bishops get upset with us because we are seen as spiritual leadership leaders. We are looked to for that. And, and they want that for themselves, which is kind of sad, that they don't know how to do it. And so nourishing our church leadership as well as our political leadership becomes important. Having a heart for everybody. It's so annoying that's what Jesus did, but that's what we're called to. It's a challenge. It's a huge challenge. So women's leadership, yeah, we need a lot more of it. Acknowledged. It exists, but it needs to be acknowledged. And Pope Francis actually is making some progress even out of Argentina. Uh, you know, Argentinans aren't necessarily the most, uh, there's sort of a macho culture. Um, but he has appointed a Franciscan woman to head one of the schools of theology in Rome, which was sort of earth shattering. So there's little bits, little bits. Never fast enough, but hey, we got work to do. That's the joy of this. There's still more to be done. We're saving some stuff for you youngins to take care of. <laughs> Let's look at it that way. How's that? Cool. Anybody else? Oh. Sister Simone, in your um, brochure here on network, there's a photograph of you and President <laughs> Obama. Can you believe? And uh, what was that exchange like? What did, what did you learn from President Obama, and what did he learn from you? Good questions. Um, I got to meet with President Obama in the Oval Office in, uh, when we did our immigration bus trip. And I had expected there to be staff there, but it was just the two of us. And the photographer for a brief moment hiding behind the couch that took the picture. And what I learned from the president was that uh, he wanted to meet with me to make sure that I knew on the immigration bus trip that I would share with the people around the country that he wanted bipartisan, comprehensive immigration reform for the sake of our nation, and he needed a, we needed a path to citizenship for our undocumented folks that are contributing to our society, and that was his top goal. Um, he also has a good sense of humor. Uh, I showed him our route, and if you remember, we started it up in Connecticut, went all the way down the East Coast, all across the bottom, and up the center of California, ended up at um, looking out at Angel Island, up at Marina, and um, he says, as President Bush might have said, ooh, I believe your route evidences some strategery on your part. <laughs> and, and so we, all, we both sort of laughed, and that was cool. I also learned that the letters he receives from people all over the country who write him affect him deeply. And that is his way, despite the bubble of security that he's in, which feels very restrictive to him, that he counts on getting some real connection. Um, I tried, on my part, to tell him stories of people that we had met. We had met these seventh grade community organizers in Camden that I thought he would appreciate. And so my idea was to try to nourish him with stories of people we had met. Because his original goal was to go to our uh, DC event, but he couldn't. I mean, he's president, he's busy. So the, the second best was to have me come. So I tried to nourish him and at the end, it was very dear, he said to me, now don't go wearing yourself out. We need you and we need your leadership. And I said to him, well, I think I should say the same thing to you. <laughs> and so we sort of laughed and hugged and um, I think both felt supported by that exchange. He's really, he's really an amazing, thoughtful, sensitive uh, man who asks questions and amazingly for a politician listens to answers, which is pretty surprising. that <laughs> They don't usually listen. Um, it was very touching. Thank you. Thank you for asking. 
One, one more? One more? And then can I end with a poem? Would that be legit? Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, Simone. Um, I come away with the idea of having one's heart broken. And it but, just, just happened last week. I listened to an interview uh, that Charlie Rose did with Bill and Melinda Gates. And that was the one thing that Melinda talked about, that when she has her heart broken, then she knows she can do something. And like what you said, Jesus moved towards trouble. And Melinda and Bill are finding it more and more that they move towards trouble. So the idea of having one's heart broken, I think that ripple effect is happening. So it's coincidental Whoa. that that happened. Whoa, that's fabulous. What great news. Good news. Thank you. The spirit is alive and well and making mischief, I tell you. Making mischief. Well, I want to end with oh, a poem. Um, I was going to do this one for sure. Okay, I think I'm going to do this, this one. Uh, because this is about the intersection of faith and justice. And the fact that uh, this, is, this is about my experience of the contemplative life. And we're all called to be contemplatives, which just means that quiet listening to the wee small voice and then act on what you hear. And it's called Living Waters. Now, some of you will remember baptism, waters, uh, holy waters, uh, uh, waters of the Jordan, Exodus waters. Okay, got waters? Okay. Because I don't mention any of that, but you have to think about it. Okay, living waters. Impetuous me favors the passionate tumult of spring, river, flooding. Sensuous me favors the indolent caress of summer, river flowing. Reflective me favors the penetrating seep of autumn river trickling. Even aloof shy me favors the chilled reserve of winter river freezing. But all of me resists evaporation. I resist the sucking, pulling, warm air resting me from known boundaries. I resist drifting unseen to unknown parts. I resist the uncertainty of unformed floating, yearning rather to surround rocks and carve new paths. I resist the ambiguous foggy drift, but luckily, at times, I am yanked into air there, beholding Earth's anguish, weep. Weeping, raining, puddling, perhaps the beginning of an exuberant spring. Thank you so much. Thank you, Simone, and thank you all of, all of you who uh, have been able to come out uh, this afternoon. Um, just a few housekeeping announcements. It's very helpful for us to have your feedback. So you should have uh, paper evaluations uh, that you were given at the door, uh, and we'll be collecting them at the table as you leave. For those of you who are SVP'd, you should have a link to an evaluation uh, in your inbox. Uh, I am to announce that we do have books available for purchase for those of you who wish. And since this is high-tech Silicon Valley, for those of you who wish to uh, receive more information about network, you may use your cell phones, even though I told you to turn them all off. Afterwards, you can text NUNS, N-U-N-S, to 877-877. Uh, for members of the religious communities here who have, who have RSVP'd for the celebration of the Year of Consecrated Life, co-sponsored with the Diocese of San Jose, please follow the directions to the, uh, of the Ignatian Center staff to make your way to the California Mission Room in the Benson Center. It's basically that way, follow the setting sun. And then I am to announce that next week we'll be featuring Father John O'Malley of Georgetown University for the Santa Clara Lecture uh, on February 5th. On February 5th at 4 p.m. in the St. Clair Room, 
uh, speaking on the topic, looking at Vatican II with Pope Francis's eyes, leadership and spirituality. The, the event is currently at capacity, although we will have overflow rooms in the library open for viewing the event. You may also watch the lecture via live stream, which you can access on the Ignatian Center's website. Let us one more time thank uh, the speaker and thank you all for coming.